bring it to a close, is to, is to say that we are very disappointed that the government has so far not decided to, include, to continue the enhanced allocations of social housing to homeless households. As you know, Minister Kelly introduced a protocol in which 50% in Dublin and 30% elsewhere of housing units went to households that were homeless or otherwise disadvantaged. That um, directive has ceased to operate and it hasn't been continued. That closes off a very important exit to, from homelessness. I think Carl Morgan said a thousand households have moved out of homelessness as a, result, as a result of that. We know very well it's unpopular. It's particularly unpopular with public representatives. It is taking from people who are pretty poor and giving it to people who are extraordinarily poor. And yes, that's not how you'd want to run society. But in the crisis that we're in, if you don't reintroduce that regulation, you are going to see the numbers of families in homeless accommodation go beyond, as Ashley said, the number of hotel rooms we have in this city and, and, uh, and around. Just to say, just a closing point, during this week, one family that our team, the, the, the street team, the housing intake team that we run jointly with Peace Very Trust, they were working with the family after midnight couldn't get their accommodation. They phoned 149 hotels in the Dublin area, in all the counties around Dublin, before they finally found somewhere to put that family up. That's 149. What a waste of their time. What a stress on the family. And what an indication of how close to breaking point they are. Thank you. Mr. Belverney, Mr. Allen, thank you for your opening comments. I'm sure there's a number of colleagues who have questions, and I suppose specifically to thank you for uh, what was a very focused presentation, because the issue of housing and homelessness is so, so broad and so complex, but you've particularly focused on the issue of prevention, and maybe colleagues in, in their questions might also try and focus on this particular area, because it's an area that you seem to have considerable expertise in. So, uh, Deputy Harty. Thank you I'll take much. a number of questions and you might respond then. Deputy Thank you Hart. very much for coming in. There was just one uh, statistic I, which struck me in, in reading your presentation. 34% of homeless are, are migrants, 17% from within the EU and 17% from outside the EU. Maybe you could comment on that? Deputy O'Brien. Thanks very much, and, and to declare an interest, I'm a former employee of, of Focus Ireland, and Mike was my line manager, so uh, uh, I'll declare that. Pardon. <laughs> I was telling him before I was going to heckle, but I probably won't do that. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, sorry, that's mine. Um, a couple of questions. Just, I, I've noticed the length of time families are spending in emergency accommodation in Dublin City and County um, is getting longer. Um, so whereas we were finding in Dublin City it was around 12 months, in South Dublin it was around 6 or 7 months, it's now hitting 12 months plus in South Dublin and 18, 20, 24 months in Dublin City. And I'm just wondering, do you have any information or any, any figures around the length of time people are in, in families are in emergency accommodation? The second is, I'm also finding that there's an increasing number of families for whom there is no emergency accommodation on any given day, um, and therefore those families are either forced to overhold uh, on private rental accommodation where they have notices to quit, uh, or they have to split the family up and make very uh, uh, difficult uh, um, arrangements, kind of multiple sofa surfing among family and friends. And again, is that something you're experiencing, and, and could you comment on it? Uh, I wasn't aware that the 50% uh, priority allocations was no longer being followed by the four Dublin local authorities. So, are you, uh, well, I know the, the directive hasn't been extended. My understanding was the local authorities were still applying it, but if that's not the case, just if you could clarify that. Um, on the rent supplement, one of the issues that some of us are grappling with is, is that if you have an across-the-board increase in rent supplement, at some stage the private rental market is going to absorb that into its overall calculation of rents. So everybody who, who makes the point that I'm in favour of the increase in rent supplement to market levels for the reason you say, uh, have you taken a position on the issue of rent certainty to try and provide a cap at the other end for where, and if so, what's your preferred uh, uh, model of rent certainty? Um, and the last is, I suppose it's this issue of, of standards in emergency accommodation, particularly for children. Um, uh, and given the fact that uh, we're seeing an increasing number of families enter into emergency accommodation, have you any specific recommendations that we should consider making in terms of how to improve that particular bit of the quality of the emergency accommodation? I know your focus is on prevention, but I'm still keen to hear your, your views on that, given the fact that your focus is on uh, families in homelessness. I missed the last question. Just, 
one of the issues for a lot of the families who are being placed in emergency accommodation is the unsuitability of that accommodation, particularly for children, and that's both the hotels and the hostels. So again, just if you have any comments or recommendations on that. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy. Um, at this stage, if you'd like to address those two, and then I'll take a couple more questions. Yeah, I might just yeah. do the rent supplement uh, one uh, first of all, uh, because this is a subject close uh, to our heart. I know there's obviously two lines uh, of thought uh, on this. Uh, at the end of the day, the rent supplement is a mechanism which people clearly think has a place in, in the system. The last increase in rent supplement goes back to, to June uh, 2013. In the meantime, rents have gone up somewhere around about 35%, uh, certainly in the Dublin area. If rent supplement has a, has a role to play here, the amount of rent, rent supplement obviously has to relate to what the market rent is. It is unfortunate that such a time lag has now occurred, such a gap has built up that we can't be as positive as we would like to be about the 15% which has been talked about at the moment. It is necessary, it is a good thing as far as we're concerned, but a hell of a gap has opened up there. 15%. Right, sorry for interrupting. No, you, you, you quite clearly said 2013 it was set. We're three years on, and you indicated that the market has grown by 30 or 35 per cent. Is a 15 per cent increase going to address the issue at all? It, it is worth doing, and it will play a positive role, not to the extent that we would like to see. Because obviously one of the arguments was that rent increases are, are driven or partly <coughs> impacted on by increases in rent supplement. And again, I would go back to the point that we have seen 35% increases with zero increase in rent supplement. So I'm not sure where that ar our argument goes. So yes, we do think it's positive. We'd like to be warmer about it eh, than we are, but that's purely because of the time lag, eh, and it, it is certainly still eh, worth doing. Okay. Sorry, Mike, you might. Yeah. Just, I mean, just to add to that, I think one of the complexities in working out the implications is that it's certainly our belief that there is virtually no household in the country on rent supplement that's not paying a top-up. Now, the Department of Social Protection say, oh, no, we've never come across anybody who's paying a top-up. Um, but you had people here from Turlestown, one of them admitted that they were paying a top-up, the immediate response of the Department of Social Protection should have been to uh, withdraw rent supplement and render them homeless. I hope they didn't do that, but we're in this complete hypocrisy of uh, you, you, you don't know what's going on, no research has been done by the department, they just assert it. So the, the risk, if you increase it by 15% or anything else, is it absorbed by reducing the top up, or is it... Uh, is the top up remain the same and the rent go up? And that's the dynamic that you don't really know. And one issue that could be considered is, at the moment it is a, essentially um, not a crime, but a, a breach of the rules by the tenant for which they will suffer if they pay the top up. But it's completely uh, commonplace among landlords to do it and there's no penalty for them doing it. So some sort of greater penalisation, for want of a better word, of the... the landlords accepting top-ups as part of the rent supplement package. But the overall thing has to eventually move to, to the longer term solution has to be the move to HAP. And we have signalled a concern there that the way the state is getting around this problem is that, HAP, that top ups are now considered legitimate in, in HAP in lots of county areas, forcing tenants to well below the poverty line. So, and just on, specifically on, on uh, Deputy O'Brien's question, um, we, have, we do support rent certainty and we support uh, the linking of rents to consumer price index as, as the, the most appropriate. Not in an absolutist way, if there are better ways, but that's the one that would work most effectively. Um, the duration of stay in the uh, emergency accommodation is, as you know, it's very hard to get detailed information on this, but we're doing a piece of work looking at the families who would have been, as you, said, as you know, um, uh, would have been homeless when Alan Kelly's directive first came into place in December 14, and they were looking at those families, the total number of families were homeless then, and how many of them are still in the system. Um, so there are, in the region of 60, the, some of them come and go over that period, so let's say around about figure of about 60, um, who are still in the, still homeless now, which is what, um, 15 months later. So that's, now it's worth saying, I think, for the committee to know that this problem will be much greater, Focus Ireland uh, um, in, had a 
a programme starting in 2011, working with all the families that were long-term homeless at the time, and actually there were 137 families in Dublin at that time, and we, as part of that project, moved them all out of homelessness into secure accommodation, so that really your start, this crisis starts with almost a clean sheet, which is, is, is something at least to be uh, grateful for. Um, on the direction of 50%, um, the problem here is when the directive is in place, we know that local authorities are obliged to do it and figure and data get published slowly and painfully, which shows that most local authorities were having huge difficulty achieving the 50%, even with the directive. It might be a very long time to find out, for us to find out what their allocations policy is in the absence of such a directive. We probably, I suppose, would settle as an interim to publishing the data and then we'd see whether there's a problem. But, but, but uh, uh, um, the... Uh, the quality of the emergency accommodation, it's very much a, a, a huge concern. Um, as, as we say in the original presentation, it has to be set alongside a recognition of the enormous challenge that the local authorities, homeless executive had in scaling up the, re the, the response and the impossibility sometimes of finding any decent room. But it has to remain the longer, if we're looking at a situation over the next two to five years where there are going to be significant numbers of families still homeless, the question of the quality of the accommodation they're in, the proximity to schools and so on, needs to be strongly addressed. And as we're putting it, we need to support those families to remain resilient while they are homeless without doing things that turn them into homeless families. And I think that's a really big challenge for, for, for the whole system. On the proportion of them who are, who are migrants, we don't necessarily have the, the, the level of data or information we would like on that area. And it's one of part of our, uh, I know the regional homeless executive is looking at it, and we're also going to look at it. There's a mixture of different circumstances there, including families who have been in Ireland for very considerable periods of time. Um, if you look at the most of the 2011 census, you find that an extraordinary number of people in living in private rented accommodation are non-Irish. So if you have a crisis in the private rented sector, it's not surprising that you end up with a, a higher percentage. In fact, it's quite a low percentage of non-Irish families, considering that's where they were living and where the crisis took place. I think that was all the... That's all for the moment. There's another series of questions coming. Um, Deputy Coppinger. Thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, welcome to the committee. And I'll just actually quickly take up that last topic about migrants because the constituency I represent, one in four people is born outside of Ireland, so we've got the most diverse constituency. And I'd actually wager we've got the most level of homelessness in the country as well, based on figures, um, based on um, the threshold helpline, I've been informed, is mainly run by people in the west and north Dublin area. And also based on the figures for homelessness in Dublin and in Fingal, and I know where most of the homelessness in Fingal is, it's in the Greater Blanchardstown area, but the reason I raise about migrants, I, I actually had put forward uh, and that we needed to bring people in to testify directly themselves about their homeless situation, and one of the families I would have had in mind would have been um, an African family. Uh, at one meeting in my constituency office that we had last year, there was 10 homeless families from the area. and We were trying to bring people together. Five of them were not Irish. So there's disproportionate homelessness hitting non-Irish people. And the reason for it is, in my opinion, as you said, they're mainly reliant on the private rented sector, which is the cause and the curse of all the homelessness. And they don't really have the same supports that other people would have if they become homeless to, you know, stay in friends for very long and stuff like that. So it's a real issue and it also brings, one of the other issues that I want to brought out was this absolute s sin of self-accommodation, where people are sent by the council to find their own accommodation, which is bad enough if you're Irish, but if you're not Irish, it's even worse because you, you've got potential language difficulties and you might comment on what you come across there because it hasn't really been brought out with the committee yet. Um, but I just wanted to take up your, your points about prevention um, of homelessness. I agree. That's the first thing that this committee has to make recommendations on. And there's some vital pieces of legislation that need to be brought in or else enacted. But just on, on the rent supplement, because this is a cause of homelessness, you say the inflexibility of the department. 
is leading to homelessness. And I think we have to nail this, that the, the state itself, through its intransigence, is making people homeless right now. Uh, we had the department in the other day. I, I raised your quote, for example, um, Ms. Rollins' quote about that it, it was um, how widespread basically it was, that it was universal, was the point you made. But um, Joan Burton last year, or the year before, said there was no evidence that it was universal. So I made the point that it seems to be the only fraud going on in social welfare that the department doesn't want to know anything about. And the reason is that the department knows that people are only defrauding themselves and therefore it doesn't care. Um, so they know that these... They, now, at, sitting over there the other day, they then did say that they had a more caring, sharing attitude and if people come to them now about their top-ups, they'll help them out. So let's see if that actually happens. But the, can you just explain very briefly why discretionary uplifts won't work? You know, this idea that if you ring us, nudge, nudge, we'll give you. Um, you know, I, I think one of the reasons it doesn't work is because, as the Peter McVerry Trust said earlier, not everyone knows these things. There's an assumption that everybody who becomes homeless is reading legal textbooks and whatever the department issues on a daily basis. Many people don't, and they're intimidated, and they're frightened, and they're not used to getting help. They don't know how to get help. Uh, and that's really what's happening. I, I am amazed people walking out of houses that they actually could have stayed in. But that's what's going on. Now, one of the, I just want to ask you about one of your recommendations. You, you recommend abolishing... Um, you know, ending of a lease for sale of a property, but only if the landlord owns more than one property, right? Now, I'd have a bit of an issue with that, and I'll tell you why, because two-thirds of landlords apparently do own only one property, according to DKM consultants in 2014. Um, now, so why should a tenant who's unlucky enough to be with a one property landlord have to become homeless, do you know what I mean, rather than somebody who has their landlord owns more than one. Um, I would ask you, if, if you want to prevent homelessness, to please advocate that across the board, um, because you have to, because otherwise this hemorrhage will continue. Could we not amend, uh, I, 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 I'm glad that you highlight the Baker judgment, I think that's what I've been calling it anyway, which is probably what people don't realise now, and that has saved the Tyrrellstown tenants thus far from eviction, because they've been able to, they went to the PRTB and challenged. There's other grounds as well that we'll use in time, but um, this is now saving a lot of people from homelessness, and basically it's actually something that we did put forward with the residential tenancies before Christmas and it was voted down, but that you would have to demonstrate that you've made efforts to sell your property, that you've actually contacted, say, an estate agent or whatever. You can't just say, I'm selling my property, out you go. And um, you're asking the government to legislate properly for that now. I think that's critical. People out there need to know that they have that support. Um, could, could, just on your one property versus others, I, I can see why you, you, you may have that clause because there, I'm sure there are cases of people who would be in grey hardship if they couldn't get back their own house. I'm assuming that's why you're putting it forward. Um, we all know people who've been, had to move in with their parents who couldn't even afford to live in their own house that they bought in the bubble era. Now, there's different things I think need to be done about that. Personally, I think we, we should have had a mortgage write-down to that was cause end a lot of our problems. But if you could prove that you had financial hardship personally to you, I mean, amendments could be put in there, but I just think if you just say only those were multiple properties. And lastly, um, just the very last one is on this reliance that you say it's called fatal reliance on the private rented sector in the government's housing policy. Um, I don't have time to go into all the figures, but I, I've gone into figures a lot in the past. And... What, what are your view of the government targets and government figures? Now, I know that's a very broad question, but for example, the Part 5. They say they have a target of 9,000 units coming from Part 5 up until 2020. That will be based on 25,000 know, know, general private houses being built every year. But last year, there was only half that amount of houses built, including most of them being one-off houses that you won't get Part 5s from. I think the government are just... I'll be kind and diplomatic... Absolutely uh, 
you're not allowed to say lying. So uh, there's certainly the, the figures do not stand up in any way, shape, or form. And it'd just be interesting. You've, your you've asked your you've asked your question. Yep. I'm, I'm going the the They're next. Important per- questions. Though. You have a number of questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, before we come to you, I'll take a, the, the other person uh, who has indicated at this stage. Deputy Durkin, have you a question? Thank you, Chairman. I, I, was, I was getting hurt there for a minute, but I'm I'm recovering from it uh, gradually. First of all, I want to uh, um, thank our, our guests for coming here th- uh, today. And to compliment them for the work that they are doing and have done for a long number of years. And like all our, 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 our witnesses this morning, it's good always to talk with people who are at the coal face, dealing with the subject on a daily basis as opposed to second hand information or whatever the case may be, because there's a lot of second hand information out there as well. And I, I know that uh, folks I have, have met with the Taoiseach recently in, and, and have uh, set out uh, your priorities, and, and rightly so. And I believe that those uh, uh, requests will be responded to. And I think it is only proper that that should be the case because we are in an emergency situation and if we don't deal with an emergency then the emergency grows so where do we where, where, where does it finish there are a few things that, that, that come to mind I think we do have to uh, arrest the rate of homelessness as it is hitting the 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 the, 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 the uh, marketplace at the moment. If we don't deal with that now, it becomes bigger and bigger. And I believe it to be a, a, to a multiplicity of approaches. The 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 the, 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 um, the modular homes, um, uh, purchase of existing houses, the use of NAMA where NAMA houses are suitable and available, the the the, the, the dedication by the various local authorities. Incidentally, a thing that has come to my attention as well, Mr. Chairman, I think is important. Because of the reliance on the private sector uh, to deal with the housing situation over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a tendency among some local authorities not to have a land bank and, and to rely on the private rent sector to provide for that part of the market. And, and the lack of that land bank is serious now because it hasn't, it's not available in order to build emergency housing, modular housing, whatever the case may be. There was another thing, Chairman, I think that's important as well. Uh, there's a certain anonymity about the way the housing situation is dealt with today. We have all been members of local authorities in years gone by, and we knew there were officials in the local authorities at the time who knew every single thing that needed to be known about individual applicants, their particular circumstances, their health circumstances, and the public representatives, equally well, well versed in the subject. That tended to push the problem forward for resolution in a much, much quicker way than has been done in, in recent times. Nowadays, there's a certain amount of anonymity. Uh, a name on a screen, and that may uh, be surpassed by the next name on the screen, and the next more serious problem comes along. So I, I would think that all that we can deal with those things separately. The arrest of those, beco- the, the rest of the speed of people coming home is evictions. I think, I think absolutely necessary that we try to prevent uh, uh, and, and, and dissuade. And we, unfortunately, we have to tell people not to vacate their houses because out on the road is not the place to be. So we, we, that's only delaying the situation. But I'm not 100% convinced about the endless increase in rent support. I have to say that. And for example, uh, I dealt with a case in the last few days that has a 100% increase in rent uh, in, the last, uh, in, the, in, the, in the last month. 100%. And I think that that's not an isolated case. Now, I know there are many, many landlords who are very conscious, have a social conscience, and, 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 and believe in social justice, and are very conscious of the need to look after their tenants in the best way possible, and they do so. There are others who don't, unfortunately. And they're the ones that, that we have to deal with, and this committee has to deal with, and Focus Ireland has to deal with, and all the other voluntary bodies have to deal with. So what, I, what I'm saying there, Chairman, is, is, is simply this, that by virtue of a combination of measures, slowing down the rate at which um, landlords are repossessing or, or evicting tenants, providing the alternative houses that we can as quickly as possible, and, and providing for the medium to long term housing requirements at the same time. We have to do them all together because otherwise we're only going to deal with emergencies. And there was a last point as well that I wanted to... to um, yes. Uh, we have to. We, we, I think that the. the I, I disagree entirely with the political point made by my colleague Claire Daly. I think there is a, a, fo- a focus in government on the need to deal with the issue. It's taking up an awful lot of time now. The Taoiseach has informed the House 
that this is a priority matter and that all government departments who have an input are going to be called upon to do so. So I think that we, 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 there's no use in spending our time um, uh, backbiting each other as to whether or not we're serious about it. I'm not here for, for, I'm not here for just the, the publicity of it. I'm not here just because I, I, I enjoy these things. I'm here because I believe that I have a role to play in resolving this problem. And everybody else around this table has a similar role and a similar conviction, I hope. And I, be I'm, I believe that they do. I believe we all do have that conviction of the need to do so. So I want to finish it off by simply saying this. I believe we apply, if we apply those principles in general, work towards the objectives that have been already set out, I believe we can solve the problem, both medium, long term and emergency. Thank, thank you, Deputy. I'm going to, just before you comment, um, I, I'd just like to remind members, uh, following on from Deputy Durkin's point, that as a committee, if we formulate proper responses to the evidence that's provided here and proper recommendations, uh, they shouldn't be alien to anybody's philosophy, they should be business-like solutions based on the evidence and the challenge for government would be to implement those. And I think, you know, that's why we're having expert witnesses like yourself and you've particularly focused on the prevention piece today and for which we're very pleased because people have come with different levels of expertise but it's incumbent on all of us to address the evidence presented at the committee with business-like solutions solutions that can be implemented. Um, gentlemen. If I might just make a couple of more general points before Mike might pick up one or two of the more specific. First of all, just not to let it pass. Uh, the idea, the phrase of uh, endless increases in rent supplement when the last uh, increase was just on three years ago. Uh, just got to stress that, that that isn't the case. There have not been endless uh, increases. And one of the reasons that we hesitate a little bit about how effective the 15% is, is, is going to be is because such a gap uh, has built up. So just to be clear about that. In terms of the, the private uh, rental market and, let, and hoping or letting the private rental market solve all, all ills, absolutely. Busted flush. No, anybody that we talk to on any side of the political divide now will, it seems, put their hands up in the air and say it has not worked, it is not going to work. So at least there is agreement uh, on that. And again, we, like a lot of other organisations involved, don't want to put the squeeze uh, on landlords uh, particularly. We want something that's going to work for landlords uh, as well. Uh, and it's only then that we can get some genuine stability uh, in the marketplace. Uh, and that's why we want a system that is going to allow that uh, to happen and an, an element of stability for both landlords uh, and tenants uh, involved. Um, and finally, in relation to uh, rent supplement and private rental market, if you have people in a private rented accommodation, keep them there. Do whatever means are possible to keep them there. Again, we come back to our, our major point. It is so much better. It is so much better for the families. It is so much more cost effective for everybody involved. If they're in private rented, keep them there by whatever means available to you. So pick, picking up on, on, on that point directly, the question about why discretionary uplifts don't work. They work to a certain extent, and when you have a, a, a small misalignment or your particular needs, discretionary measures do work, and they've always been part of the Red Supplement system and the SWA system. So the creation, while the threshold initiative is very positive, it actually is putting into effect something which has always been in the SWA legislation around discretion. But they don't work on the scale of the problem we've got now, because the, 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 the principle of all social policy dealing with people who are poor or vulnerable is, if we could find them and target them and give them the support they need and not give any support to people who don't need it, wouldn't that be wonderful? And it would be in every area. But how do you find the people? Because the, the very people who are the most vulnerable are the ones either because of language issues or because they're so under stress or literacy issues. Or is that, they're the ones who don't hear about the system. They're the ones who don't hear about the existence of the, the discretionary payments. So they're the ones who are the most vulnerable and don't get your discretionary uh, sort of intervention. So those are all the issues that you mentioned, but that's exactly it. And that's why there's a constant debate in social policy between universal and targeted measures. And if you can't find the people to target, you're going to have to do things which are more universal, and that's where we are on the rent supplement. It's also worth saying, in terms of picking up again Ashley's point about the, the scale of which we've relied on the, 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 rent, the private rented sector in this area, I think 
there were very few people who wouldn't accept that that was a catastrophic error to have so many people who are vulnerable to poverty, their homes relying in the private rented sector, with the taxpayer having to pay the bill if rents go up. Right? I don't know if there's anybody who defended and said that wasn't a mistake. The question is now who pays for that mistake? It, yes, it's an enormous amount of money to give to private landlords to get us out of that mistake. But the alternative is you make the people who ended up living in those houses pay for that mistake. So nobody can say that it's good social policy to give lots of money to landlords in this area. It doesn't make any sense. But we're not starting from that question. We're starting from the fact that we have had 50, 60, 70,000 households living with that level of vulnerability. And how do you, as the successors of the legislators who made those errors, deal with the fact that those people are now in, in the risk that they're in? And it might mean spending money that doesn't, wouldn't make many sense, much sense if you turn back a number, number of years. But we've given a lot of money to a lot of more undeserving people because of mistakes that were made in the past. In terms of the social housing numbers um, and how they were delivered, um, the way I put it is I think there were certain assumptions about the speed at which the private developing, private developing market would pick up and start generating new housing estates and therefore generating part five properties that were built into the plan when it was written. And those assumptions turn out not to have been true. Now, whether you could have seen that before, and it's a different matter. But, and I do think that those, the, the current minister has said a number of things that would give you some faith that he recognises that and believes that there are alternative things need to be done rather than waiting for the private sector to just generate social housing as a byproduct. Time will tell whether, whether that's uh, the, the case. And just to say, the, the single landlords thing, um, it's, it's really the same issue about targeting people. You're right. Uh, we, what we didn't want to do was get into a position where we were saying this should be abolished, this right to, to terminate the lease if you want to sell, and suddenly be inundated with um, people with who severe disabilities or whatever who needed to sell the home or needed to move people back in and were caught. And you are right that there might be more nuanced ways of identifying <coughs> So it's not just a blanket right to sell, but a higher level of proof is required and a longer period of time. But it is important to remember the whole private rented sector in the buy-to-let market in, in Ireland is based on the notion that, pe that the house is a commodity which the investor can sell to get their uh, return on their investment rather than they're actually running a business, which is the business of which is to provide somebody else with a home. So we can't change that overnight, but I do think we need to be moving it very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Allen. There are one or two brief comments. I know we're near the end of the session, but I, I'll take them at, at this stage. And if you wouldn't mind keeping them brief, no, not you, Deputy O'Sullivan, your second, Deputy Moore first. <laughs> in, then... in relation to the amount of families, and I just recognise what it's a huge problem out there with the small kids that's becoming, I suppose, trapped in this homelessness crisis. But if you take the families and the homes that's been affected in terms of what's going on with the banks, would it be what we're talking about in relation to the state? If you take a, a, an ordinary person's a mortgage in the house, let's say 900 quid a month, the person in the house lost a job and there's one person paying, say they can afford to pay 400, what would your terms in terms of the state in, intervening, helping out in terms of topping up in relation to the mortgage. It prevents those people then coming out to agencies like yourselves, agencies and local authorities, I think it would stop us looking for hotels. What would your view on that? In terms of if we could find a mechanism to do that, review it, say, if the circumstances change in three to four, maybe five years, that exactly what you said a second ago, the people then that maybe back in the, in, in the job business be able to pay off the debt that's already to the state, rather than us putting these people a victim out onto the street. I'd just like to hear your views in relation to it. Thank you, Deputy. And finally, Deputy O'Sullivan. Thank you. When, um, when we were working last year in the private members' bill on prevention of homelessness, the Scottish model was given as an example. And I just think it would be useful to have a look, to just outline just a couple of points from that that we could perhaps put into our report. Thank you, Dep Deputy. There are the final uh, contributions on this side. If you'd have any concluding remarks in relation to those Should points. Just yeah. yeah. so some specific points. I think there are various different models for um, mortgage, uh, for people in mortgage arrears, which would allow them to deal with the situation through some forms of loans from the state or equity purchases and so on. It wouldn't be our area of expertise, but we would be supportive of, of, of notions like that. Um, we can put maybe in a short written memo about a couple of points from the, the Scottish model, though as somebody who was born in 
Wales of an Irish family. Uh, the Welsh model is now coming onto the, uh, onto the map with a very effective piece of legislation about preventing homelessness, which is well worth looking. So rather than taking the committee's time now, we'll drop in a note in the future. I'm not meaning to rush yeah. you or anything, but would you do that sooner rather than later in the sense that this committee is working to a deadline? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and our, our final comment would be, no matter what country and no matter what piece of research you're looking at, the message will be the same, that every penny spent in prevention will come back to you in spades, uh, as against the same penny spent on emergency accommodation in one shape or form. Mr. Allen, uh, Mr. Alberni, thank you very much for your, uh, first of all, your written submission and your presentation today, and particularly the focused nature of uh, what you were presenting today. Uh, I think the committee will find it useful in our deliberations. Thank you. Uh, we'll suspend for a couple of moments. While at the outset, once again, to remind anybody with mobile phones, if they'd either turn them off or to flight mode. And I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting, and members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Simon Communities of Ireland uh, to our meeting this afternoon, represented by Neve Randall, Bill Griffin, uh, Dermot Kavanagh and Sam, Mc Sam McGuinness. As I said at the outset, uh, we have received uh, your submission. It has been circulated to members and will be published on the website afterwards. So if you would like to make an opening statement or a summary of that, uh, and we'll follow on from that with questions from the members. So thank you. Well, first of all, just to say thank you very much to the committee and to the chairman for having us here today. We really do appreciate it. And um, we have been watching the sessions with great interest. We're very aware you've had a lot of information and a lot of people in. So what we're trying to do today is to focus on the solutions that we think are most necessary for the people using Simon services all around the country. So we're really not trying to repeat any testimony you've had. There's a lot of detail in our submission. And if you've got questions on that, we're very happy to take them later. I suppose just to explain a little bit about the Simon community, we're a national work network working all around the country, providing local responses to to local needs and issues, and we're based in Cork, Dublin, and Dork, Galway, the Midlands, the Midwest, the Northwest, and the Southeast. We have a very special commitment to working with those who face the most barriers, so working with those who've got the most complex support needs. And we're seeing the impact of this housing and homeless crisis in every region and every community around the country. So it isn't just in urban areas, we're also seeing it in rural areas around the country. We really welcome the appointment of a Minister for Housing and Planning and Local Government, and it's critical that Minister Coveney has the full authority and responsibility to address this particular crisis. And that means having full Cabinet support. It also means having cross-departmental support with the key departments of Housing, Finance, Public Expenditure and Reform, Social Protection, Health and the HSC. But also it needs the cross-party support, and I suppose that's where this committee comes in here. And we really welcome the collaborative approach that you're all taking to working on this issue together. When well, thinking about coming in here today, I was thinking about Jim, a man who I met who was working in one of the temporary uh, accommodation services which was open in December 2014. And Jim has very serious physical health and mental health issues. He sleeps nightly in a dorm with about 20 other people and then by the day he walks the street. And the staff in this service are absolutely brilliant. They're really doing their best to key work, to care plan, to case manage. But it's so difficult in an environment like this. And I think it's people like Jim that we seldom hear about who all from the state has failed time and time again. Of those trapped in emergency accommodation right now, there's 2,700 people who are single without dependents in their care right now. It's critical that we learn from past mistakes and that we change expectations. The expectation has to be that people can and will move on from homelessness very quickly into a home of their own. Some may, be, some may need support at some point, but don't we all at some stage in our lives? This must be the expectation of people who are homeless themselves, it must be the expectation of staff and volunteers, and it must be the expectation of government. In fact, we are told that this is the case with the commitments in the homelessness policy statement in 2013. But we need to agree that every man, woman and child in the state 
has a right to a safe, secure and affordable home and then we need to do this. We've included much detail in our submission about housing supply across all tenures and I won't go into that but I will draw your attention to a call that we are making today and that is for a limited period that 100% of all social housing allocations will be made to people who are long term homeless. We make this call as the numbers in emergency accommodation peaked to over 6,000, the highest it's ever been this particular week was reported. This would apply to all local authority areas where long-term homelessness is an issue and it would last until this issue is resolved in those particular local authorities and it would apply to those who are stuck in homeless services for over six months and that's the government's definition of long-term homelessness as you know. So it would be people who are in homeless services prior to December 2015. I will now hand you over to my colleagues who are going to do just a couple of short inputs. So Bill Griffin is going to speak about the right to housing, Dermot Cavan is going to speak about rough sleeping and long-term homelessness, and Sam McGuinness will speak about prevention and families who are homeless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's not surprising that um, the obsession of everyone these days is in dealing with the immediate, in dealing with the emergency, in getting people off streets and getting shelter over people's heads. And what we're doing is we're actually, while all that is happening, and for as long as it's going to happen, we're moving away from any consideration of the right to housing for all of our citizens. If you don't pin something, underpin something um, in rights, then you're always, as I said in the submission, you're a supplicant at the table of resources. And if you're at the back of the queue, as, as the people we deal with, are at the back of the queue, then your, your, your chance of realising um, a, a home is um, very limited. We, we have, uh, Ireland has obligations under five international covenants related to it in which housing is specifically um, stated. And the, U the Universal Declaration of Human Rights talks about everyone having the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of, the, of himself and his family. Um, the, the right to housing is not about just having a roof over your head. Um, the definition of that right is that it should have security of tenure associated with it. There should be availability of services, materials and infrastructure. It should be affordable and it should be habitable. And if you think of those um, four, four or five areas, they are some of the difficulties that we're actually dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and that the legislature is having to deal with as well as those of us that are providers. The implications of that absence of a right-based report, if I can't follow my right to a home, is, is ending up with what's happening at the moment um, up and down the country. Um, tenants are being given notice to quit because banks are forcing landlords to realise their assets to pay loans um, or they are unable to keep up with rising rents. Um, there is no consideration. It's all being done legally. You get the notice to quit, etc. But the reality is you end up homeless. The reality is you end up in a hotel in Galway for months on end. Um, landlords, the schemes that were set up to actually give protection are now falling apart. Landlords are leaving in great numbers the rental accommodation scheme, which was designed to actually give security of tenure both to the tenant and also to the landlord. And why are they doing it? And I'm talking from the man who's down in Galway. They can get better rent higher rent in the open market and the standards that are associated with the RAS scheme are not applicable. Okay, so when it comes to the end of the three years, they're moving away from it. The councils can't, can't get them to re-engage. Even with um, Galway councils paying a little bit extra, it's still not bridging the gap between what they're allowed to pay and the, the, the current market. Um, the freezing of rent supplement in 2013, at the time the resistance to, to calls from all sides was made on the basis that if rent supplement was allowed to keep pace with market rent, that it would fuel rent rises. Well, it's happened. Rent rises have happened all through the country without any contribution from people who are dependent on social welfare. In the current discussion, housing, 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 we hear about housing, 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 but to help somebody to maintain their house, they also need support services related to health and social needs. Over the last four years, 20% of the social inclusion budget of the HSE, which is the smallest care group within the HSE, has disappeared. There is no discussion going on about reversing that. I was even, I was even told it yesterday at a meeting in, in our local HSE. While, while unions are, are um, trying to get um, wages reversed for staff that were cut during that period. There is no discussion about the people that they serve. That is, that is leading us into more and more problems where people cannot access the support they need to prevent them from losing their homes. 
People, because they have no rights, are ending up in overcrowded emergency hostels. And while we appreciate that, yes, you have to have an emergency response, but a dormitory response is not a solution. It's, mean, it's merely an emergency response. Decisions about allocations are being increasingly discussed in terms of who deserves, and that's a very sad, and we hear it every day, and what's happened here is, and I'm sure you've heard it all through the submissions, the influx of families into this sector over the last number of years, they are now seen formally and informally as the priority. The people that we are dealing with, there's 2,700 individuals without any family connections who are still in emergency things, they are being trapped there. So please don't forget that families are not the only issue here. Certainly we don't want children growing up in hotel rooms, but don't let that um, satiate and say we've dealt with the problem if we've dealt with families in, in hotel rooms. Um, as supply dwindles, prioritisation of smaller and smaller groups is occurring and discussions about who deserves that housing. So. What I would suggest to the committee, what we're suggesting to the committee, while we're dealing with the emergency, while we're looking at other solutions that my colleagues will talk about, please don't abandon the consideration of the right to housing to all of our citizens. Only a week or so ago, legislation was pushed through in terms of hard-pressed mortgage holders. Okay, good for those of us that can afford a mortgage. What about hard-pressed people who will never be able to afford a mortgage in the foreseeable future? Thank you very much. Mr. Kavner. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about rough sleeping and long-term homelessness and the link between the two. Uh, the first point I want to make is that emergency accommodation is not a solution to homelessness. Uh, we have, a, a, as Bill has pointed out, seen a response to the crisis of rough sleeping, which involved the provision of a, a lot of extra shelter beds, often dormitory beds. As a strategy, it doesn't address homelessness. In the long run, it leads to the problems of institutionalisation and dependency, and over time, this solution itself becomes the problem. Uh, in terms of a solution that works, I'm sure you've heard a lot about Housing First. Housing First means housing people without preconditions, uh, our expectations of people being housing ready. Uh, you put people into housing and you provide support in housing, and that involves clinical support, housing support, and support towards community reintegration. Uh, when you look at the problem of long-term homelessness, it's interesting to look at recent analysis of shelter usage, both in Cork and Dublin. Uh, Bernie O'Donoghue Hines of the Homeless Executive presented a paper some months back called Patterns of... Uh, emergency accommodation use in Dublin and uh, she found, consistent with international findings from the United States, Denmark, Canada and other places, that uh, when you looked at it, the vast majority of emergency shelter bed nights are uh, accounted for by people who are either long term or episodically homeless. Uh, homeless people can be divided into to, to, to three groups according to these analyses. A group that is homeless in the short term and have few episodes of homelessness. A group that is homeless repeatedly and has a number of episodes of homelessness. And a group that's long term homeless who are more or less in the shelter system long term. And if you look at that, uh, they found that um, between 2012 and 2014, 7,254 people used emergency accommodation uh, in Dublin, and 13% of that 924 people uh, were long-stay shelter residents, and they accounted for 52% of the emergency bed nights during the period. When we looked at our data in our, in our emergency shelter in Cork, Simon, uh, we found remarkably similar findings. Uh, we looked at the people in 2015 and the proportion of them who met the government's definition of long-term homeless, that was uh, 12% and that group accounted for 51% of the shelter bed nights last year. These statistics clearly suggest that a strong focus on housing people who are long-term homeless will have the greatest uh, effect on freeing up emergency bed nights and thereby eliminating uh, rough sleeping. So if we look at the, the Cork Simon Emergency Shelter, on any given night, it's, it's, it's a 44-bed shelter. On average, we have 50 people in there per night. And on any given night, 25 of those people meet the government's definition of long-term homeless. Um, over the course of last year, 48 people in total met the government's definition of long-term homeless. 
if we were, there are roughly 18,000 bed nights a year in Cork Simon Shelter. If we were to house those 48 people and provide support and housing, we would free up 9,000 bed nights. Uh, an average of 25 beds per night. We have nine people sleeping rough in the city. You know, we could go back to our official number of 44 in the shelter and have, uh, have, have some spare rooms. So, what holds true for Cork and the micro level holds true for Dublin as well. If getting the housing supply is crucial, but targeting it at people who are long term homeless is equally crucial. And it provides uh, the greatest impact on addressing not just the crisis of long term homeless, but the rough sleeping crisis itself. So that's a core takeaway. Um, now, when you look at the group who are long term homeless, what you find is that on average they tend to have more complex issues than people who are homeless in the short term. Um, very often you'll be dealing with challenging issues relating to health, uh, mental health, addiction and so on. There is a long uh, list of well documented international research studies showing that the best way to address the housing needs and the overall health needs of people with those issues is to provide housing first and then to provide support on those issues in housing. We've been running a programme like that in, in Cork Simon and some of the other Simon communities around the country have been running similar programmes and they are very successful. We housed 34 people in 2013. We've tracked them each year. Uh, at the end of 2015, 85% remained housed. Uh, what this shows is that this intervention can effectively deal with long-term homelessness and rough sleeping. Uh, now, there's a challenge here because there's a lot of talk about homeless funding, and it's crucial, but a lot of the focus is on Department of Environment funding. If we had the supply of houses tomorrow, and if we took measures to ensure that that supply was prioritising those, as Niamh said, who are long-term homeless with 100% of allocations, and we move people into housing, we need more than just housing support, we need clinical support, we need support with mental health issues, we need a support with addiction issues, and we've had strong cutbacks in those areas in previous years, and the HSE will have to put the funding in place to ensure that this strategy will work, but it certainly can have a, a, a huge impact. At this point, anyway, I'll hand over to Sam. Who... Yeah, I, I'm, in, the, in the summary, we have a, an area called Prevention and Homeless Families, and I'm just going to point out the major areas and maybe make some comments on that. The yes, first one is a requirement for a comprehensive plan for the private sector, and I think uh, private rented sector. I think you've heard that already a number of times in other submissions, actually. So, and then the extension of Section 10 funding for further prevention work and pushing that out nationally, ensuring a statutory obligation for the provision of advice and information, and pushing that out. So a lot of work has been done in, in some of the Dublin areas on that, and ensure national and regional homeless strategies are in place. And I think I, I want to make some comment on that, and increase the availability of rapid build housing, and I'm sure we all have lots of comments to make on that. And then, then the immediate investment in Housing First. It's very clear, unless presently we can secure people in their homes, we'll continue to have 70 plus families and a lot of other single people becoming homeless. So then the question is, there's a lot of detail in our submission and other people's about how to do that. When we get on to a major area like ensuring national and regional homeless strategies are in place. I did a little bit of work, because I've been around this sector, unfortunately, one would say, for too long. We should have solved the problem by now. But when you go back to 2013, there was a housing policy statement in February. And then we had construction 2020 in May 2014. And then we had a social housing strategy in 20, for 2020 for in November 2014. And then we had an implementation plan, the state's response, in May again. And then we had a 20-point action plan. And now we have progress for partnership and we have this committee and something different has to happen because 
too many documents have been written and there clearly hasn't been enough action. So whatever comes out of here, I think it's a wonderful, disparate group of people that can actually make a difference. And I think the other piece of it is in pushing that up to the level of having a Minister for Housing and the Taoiseach, something different has to happen now because it's a slight on all of us that 6,000 people are now homeless and it's increasing. The other major initiative I'd like to comment on, and it's about rapid housing. Now, um, I, was, I was informed that this would happen in time for Christmas. 22 buildings would be ready and people could move into them. Now, just around the time we were meeting Minister Coveney, people had just started to move in there, and that was in May. Now, that's a long time. And it's a long time, I'd say it's a lot happens between cup and lip, but that's an extraordinary long time. The other day, I was down just across the road from the Digital Hub. And Digital Hub gave, I can't remember the name of the builder, uh, uh, he tendered, obviously, and they were building 500 student apartments. And they started in July 2014, and they'll be ready in September, this September. Now, that's not necessarily extraordinary, but obviously a commercial builder can do that. Now, the site was ready, obviously, the Planning Commission was there, but we need more of that. We need things that can happen. And they could have been 500 people, not necessarily um, homeless or, or, or students. They could have been homeless people, and it would have been amazing in terms of what we could do. Now, by the way, there are a lot of other sites around there. And I think those sites could actually be something could be done to restructure the availability of sites like that for the problems that we have. One other last thing I'd like to say is about the infrastructural deficit. I mean, in Dublin Simon alone, in the last three years, we have provided more accommodation than we have in the previous 30, because there was a need and we could see it. So we have provided homes for an excess of 350 people. We used 6 million of our own money that we got from legacies and donations and everything, and we got 8 million from CAS. Now, that's a huge effort, and without that effort, I think that we would be totally distraught in trying to help all the people that we're helping. We need more effort like that. So for AHBs like ourselves, we need financing. We have just gotten approved for the Housing Finance Agency, but we need CAS as well, and we need other facilities, because the AHBs...